Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to start. So welcome everybody to our next Scientix webinar. Today webinar title is The World is My Classroom, Using Digital Tools to Help Develop Language Skills in the Science Classroom. And uh, our presenter, Fiona, will share with you her story. So please um, uh, listen uh, patiently. If you have any questions, please use our chat. Uh, uh, function. Uh, so uh, after all, when Fiona will finish her presentation, she will go over all questions and answer by doing her best. So Fiona, floor is yours. You have 45 minutes for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Fiona. I'm a, a science teacher in Sweden, um, but I originally come from the United Kingdom. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I have done um, in my classroom to help promote to language learning within the science classroom. Because I work in international schools um, it's quite important for us to focus on on language uh, because it impacts so much on our students abilities to uh, perform uh, although i work in sweden i deliver my science lessons in english and so some of for a lot of our students they're learning science in a second maybe even a third or a fourth language so it's really quite an important focus for our school to, to look at how we can help them communicate what they know in science um, using a language that isn't always very familiar to them. Um, my purpose today isn't really to, to turn around and say, you know, this is what the research yeah, is. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just uh, sorry that I disturb you, but could you please put the science scientists online meeting room uh, window so everybody can see your presentation? Can share with everybody okay oh, i thought i'd done that sorry oh perfect thank you oh, cool um sorry about that is about in my classroom to, to help um, some of the tools that you that I'm going to show you you might already be familiar with um, but you might not necessarily have thought about using them in a particular way um, I should point out that in no school that I've worked in have I ever had one-to-one -one computers I've always had to share computers with other other teachers other classes um, in one of the schools, we only had 30 students between 1,200, uh, 30 computers between 1,200 students. Um, so I know that it's you know, nothing that I've done here has cost money or it's uh, been implemented in one-to-one -one school situations. So, so just to give you a, a kind of idea as to how I have developed uh, some of this stuff. It kind of started back in 2007 when I was working in the United States and I started looking at how I could use web pages in my classes uh, to promote sharing of science information and stuff. And from there I've moved from me controlling the web page to actually handing over more and more control to my students as a means of helping them uh, communicate what they learn with the outside world. And through that I've formed links with with people all over the world that have actually been involved in various projects that we've done in our classroom, helping our students to see how science works in a, a more realistic way and communicating with, with other people in other parts of, of the world. So, part of where it started back in 2007, I made a Google site. Um, if you're familiar with the Google platform, Google Sites is a free web authoring service. Uh, so everything is, is free. Uh, at the time, I think I was the only teacher ever use, using it in our area. 
but I mainly used it simply to kind of share documents with students. So, for example, if the students were having to do a research project, I might share them the list, a list of questions via Google Sites. Um, it then became a good way of storing good websites that students found. So it became a kind of two-way dialogue between me and my students, but it was really just all about delivering information. Then I started to look at how can students actually present their, their information. And I started off by looking at something called ThingLink. Um, I hope you can see the cursor here. That's just there. Um, I'm going to um, just show you the site itself. This is it here. Um, ThingLink is a way of getting students to present information in a slightly different, different way. So, for example, I might give them pictures created a picture of my, my classroom and then students have to describe that picture in, in certain ways and they can put different uh, call outs to give different information um, and I hope you can kind of see this okay where my, my cursor is so the students can collaborate on a picture um, and provide information and I started finding that that was a slightly different way of, of doing things compared to the traditional uh, draw me a poster to explain the life cycle of a of a butterfly you know it's it's kind of find me a picture and then actually write text on it to explain what you have have done and this kind of elevated the the level of engagement that students have with the the process of presenting their their information so that was something that i, I found quite useful but at this Stage, I'm still really mainly just uh, delivering delivering in terms of just um, information delivery both ways um, but it was quite good for helping with things like uh, web quests and helping the students to think about how they can present their information in different ways From there, though, I moved back to the United Kingdom in 2000 to use social media in a slightly more creative way to help with their, their language development. And this came about at the time where social media was only really just starting to have an impact in, in schools. And so it was quite a novel way of, of doing things. And it struck me that one of the things that I loved about working in an international environment was the way that you could build cult good strong cultural links and I, I went looking at the time at things like e-twinning and um, uh, other things like Skype in the classroom which was just starting up and everything seemed to have a very humanities or you know social sciences and cultural and language type focus there didn't seem to be very much in terms of science so I thought how can I actually start using these things in a more sciencey kind of way and then I, I started to realize that um, actually teachers had al already been using social media anyway in the classroom every time we get students to read text together or draw a poster together or create a PowerPoint presentation together they're using media in a social way so how can we then take take that and have a, a slightly bigger impact on things and I guess the the conclusion really from this phase of the work was the idea that small tools make a, a big impact there were a number of tools I used, uh, link on uh, other ones included Padlet or Linoet and uh, Twitter which I use a, a bit I actually want to share a, a link with you so that I can show you a little bit about how to use Padlet I'm going to share this with um, it <clears throat> so, yeah. hopefully everyone can can see that um, if you click on that link if you click on that link then you should be able to see this web page here 
Um, this I've created as a as a demonstration. Um, it's very similar to a um, and you can set it up. You can set it up with uh, permissions so that you have to uh, review posts before they post. But I set this one up so that everyone can kind of access it. And if you can see my my cursor in the middle here, um, in order to access or add anything to the board, all you have to do is double click somewhere on the the board itself. So if I double click, a new box will appear, and I can write in the new box, and I can summarize what I might have learned or a question that I might want to ask. I can add links, I can add pictures. And then if you just click off it, yours will appear. And uh, we can see we've got one added in already. Um, so the students, I started off using this as a, a way of collecting summaries at the end of, of lessons. So asking students to reflect back on what they've learned and post a post-it note. And the first time they use it, they get all excited and, and stuff because you can display this on your board and they see it appearing real time. <laughs> and that does two things. Firstly, it engages them a lot with what they're doing. But secondly, it, it makes them have to think a little bit more about how they're saying things because now everybody Everybody can see what they're writing and when everybody can see what they're writing they start to have to think a little bit more carefully about how they phrase things then on top of that because it's available on the internet you can share it with parents and parents can see what has been happening in, in the lesson so while I started small using um, the, using it just to summarize learning we then moved on to adding links onto things so that we could see what we had, had found in our research, sharing good research with each other, and communicating with the outside world as well. And if you haven't seen Padlet before, it's a, a really very powerful tool. As well as that, it, it gets kept too. So it, uh, it's quite good for being able to keep hold of the information for when you're grading or assessing further down the line and you can you can go back or if you're doing a, a longer project you can start it at the beginning and then go back and, and reflect but from a language point of view it's uh, really important to get the students to summarize what it is that they've actually learned from lessons and, and research and it's a really good way of, of trying to get them to focus in on what the the most important points are and a lot nicer than having lots of post-it notes flying around all over your, your whiteboard or your, your room. Um, other things that I used were, uh, let me see if I can find this one. I'm thinking today for this one here. Again, I'll show you the link so you can have a play. Um, for those of you that use Twitter, it's very similar to, to Twitter, um, except for the fact that instead of being public, it's actually a closed room and you have to actively join the room. So you can keep the room closed within your classroom. You can give the students nicknames so they don't have to post with their real name. But it, other than that, it works very similar to, to Twitter in that the students have to summarise what they are learning or their questions or whatever in only 140 characters. You can use hashtags like you do in Twitter and, and stuff as well, which is very good. But it gets over the, the fear of using Twitter because Twitter is so open. A lot of schools are very nervous about using it. Certainly back in 2009, um, they didn't really want us to use it much at all. But this allowed us to keep the same kind of idea, but keep it in a in a closed environment um, and you again you can add like links and things one of the things that I found this particular tool was useful for was when we had to do debates or topics 
about sensitive subjects like sex education or or drugs education or that that kind of thing because it allows those students who wouldn't normally speak in your class uh, a forum to actually ask their questions in a safe a safe way one of the best features of this as a teacher is it allows you to save the conversation as a PDF file afterwards. So you can set the, the group to be only open for, say, a week, and then you can save the conversation as PDF, close the group, no one has access to it, but you still have a, a, a printed copy, printable copy of the conversation that the, the students have had. Again, because students are able to see what's being written, it actually helps them, and they have a character uh, limit as well, it helps them focus their language a little bit more into, you know, what are the most important words that I need to know? How's the best way of, of phrasing this? One of my personal favourite stories uh, at the time of using this, this stuff, I set up a, a class Twitter account as well, and I was working with uh, some uh, students, they were 11 or 12, um, and we were doing about the space unit, and they were asking questions about, you know, space and rocket ships and, and stuff. And, you know, we got the, the usual questions like, you know, how do astronauts go to the toilet in space? And uh, being interested in that kind of stuff, I knew the answers to those kind of things. But then one little girl asked, um, how do they keep themselves clean? When they're in the International Space Station, how do they keep themselves clean? And I didn't know that. So I put the question on our class Twitter account. And I don't know if you're aware, but there are quite a lot of astronauts that use Twitter. And we got a reply from a, an astronaut who was on the International Space Station. And as a result of that, our students were able to have a conversation. This was in 2010 with an, a real astronaut, which was hugely uh, engaging for them. I mean, it was a fan, it's one of my personal favourite uh, things about what I've done as a teacher. The kids were were completely enthralled by all of this. So something like using Twitter uh, can have a, a, a big impact. It's a small free tool, but with a big impact. Um, there are still uh, and teachers that feel a little apprehensive an alternative is actually to get the benefit from the, the summarising uh, aspect of it. We've actually to do it on paper. And this is what, if you can see my, my template here, this is what I did. I created a grid with 140 characters and the students had to fill it in. This allows them to summarise it. It allows them to keep an eye on how many characters they're actually using. And you can make like classroom displays and, and things. So you get the benefits of summarising that learning, uh, focusing on how to summarise it and the language that you use, but again, keeping it within the, the confines of your, of your own classroom. So the small you help learning and asking questions. Once you've kind of got the kids understanding about how to summarise things, my next step really was to take that a little bit bigger and to go from something like a microblogging tool like Twitter to actually using real blogs. And this is kind of important because one of the things that we tend to do a lot in, in science, certainly in, in Sweden, is get the students to write like reports or newspaper articles to to debate certain things. Um, but I thought, how about we take that a little bit further? How about we go um, a little bit different on it? I've actually used two blogging tools, uh, EduBlogs and KidBlog. Both of them are free. Both of them were set up with uh, teachers and, and education in mind. There are other ones out there. These are just the two that I like because they use the WordPress uh, format of blogging. Um, and I've used that to get students to actually present their research in, in different ways. Uh, for example, one of the things we did, we did a research project on the different elements in the periodic table. 
and each student had to present what they've learned as a blog post. That enables them to think about not just their, their written uh, presentation, but also about how to use images, how to use videos instead, um, which is very good for those students who have problems with written language. And it also started me thinking about um, how I can engage the outside world in my my classroom. So I had uh, the kids, English teachers, you know, people outside of the classroom, English teachers actually reading the blog posts and commenting on, on their language so the students can develop their language a little bit better. The big thing that I noticed about this was, and this is probably my biggest uh, finding from all of the stuff that I've done, is that by doing this, students then start to have an authentic audience for the work that they do. It's not just their teacher reading a report in a textbook. People from all over the world can see it. People from all over the world can comment on it. Yes, there are safety issues to think about. Um, I always give my students an anonymous code so they never publish their, their names. All blog posts and comments have to be approved by me before they can be published. So you have to take those kind of things into consideration. But it has enabled us to do things that, have, that might not have happened otherwise. For example, a group of students did uh, a project on uh, the physics is behind motorbikes. And we published our research on the blog. And through various connections, I managed to get a mechanic from a, a motorcycle racing team to actually come and comment on their their posts and answer some of the questions that they'd posed. So we were able to bring experts in and have a dialogue, uh, not in real time, but it didn't matter that it wasn't in real time. Um, to get that expert into school to actually have a lecture with the students would have cost a, a, a prohibitively large amount of money. But here we were able to actually have a, a non-real-time dialogue between my students and an expert, helping them to actually uh, develop the text that they had written to make it more, uh, more cohesive. From, from that kind of thing, there are other uh, blogging type tools that have, have been available. One of my favourites is something called quad blogging, uh, which enables uh, four schools to link up together to do a shared blog uh, on a given theme. Um, so using this kind of stuff uh, has allowed students to have a, an audience for their work. And once they have that audience for their work, they start thinking more about how they actually phrase their their work, how they structure it, are they using a good structure, are they spelling things correctly, is their grammar correct, correct? because they know that everybody is going to be able to, to read it. On top of that, they do get a bit of a kick out of having people from around the world read, read their work. From there, I probably what we um, and this one's probably the one that has the most direct link in with science. Um, I have some connections with my former school that I taught in in the United States. And we decided that what we wanted to do was a global collaboration between the two schools, my school in Sweden and their school in North Carolina. Everything that we did in this instance, wiki spaces, very similar to Google Sites. Um, that uses the wiki platform um, and it was myself and another science teacher in North Carolina and we decided we would do an ecology project and what we might normally do in schools is uh, certainly here where we live we have uh, a lot of lakes around so the students might go and sample do water sampling from the lakes and find out the different qualities of water but how cool would it be if you could get the data from lakes in other parts of the world? And that's what our project kind of started doing, because where they lived in North Carolina was similar, but very, very different climate to where we were. So we took the same basic science lesson that we would have done uh, anyway, and then we kind of turned it on. 
a little bit. We got to prepare the experiment for the students in the United States to do using Google Maps to highlight areas that they were supposed to go and do their sampling with. And then the students in America did the same for us. We shared hypotheses using a, a tool called Linoit, which is similar to Padlet. So we could see uh, the predictions that students were making. We also shared uh, ideas about where the water sampling should happen as well. And then we shared our uh, final presentations using Google Docs with each other. Um, and that, that was quite good for a number of reasons. The, the first thing was that our, our students here, English is their, their second language. And here they were having to talk to students their own age in English. And that made them have to uh, prepare themselves a little bit more carefully so that the other students could understand. And then similarly, the students in the United States had to develop their language too because they had suddenly found that they were not able to use the same kind of vocabulary that they may have used to their own classmates. So they had to think about how to explain certain concepts to people who didn't know the English language well enough to be able to just understand what, what they were saying. And that was quite good because uh, it enabled the students to communicate together uh, on their own terms, but within a safe framework of of uh, having the teachers there helping them to structure what they were doing. On top of that, we then went, took it uh, a little bit further and we had, had, had some Skype sessions with students. So the students got to the schools. So from doing this project, we were targeting not just their written and reading comprehension, we were also able to target their spoken uh, comprehension as, as well because they were having to converse with each other. Um, it was a little difficult to organise in terms of time and, and stuff, but the kids got a, a lot out of it, a lot out of it, and it was really good fun. From there, I, I stayed with my class into the following year, and the following year, did another project this time we were school in the United Kingdom. And this time we were doing the, the standard uh, lab investigation looking at reaction times. And we thought, well, I know that students in the United Kingdom are doing this investigation and we're doing it. How about we combine the, the data? And then that way we, we got talking about sample size and, and stuff. And we got the students to, to make predictions on based on two questions. One was about whether boys have faster reaction time and uh, uh, reaction times than girls. And the other one was, would the students in Sweden have a, a faster reaction time than the students in Britain? And we collected all the data through Google Forms. If you've never used Google Forms, it's quite a nice way of making up uh, questionnaires. Um, not only that, but it, it does a lot of the data analysis for you and will provide graphs uh, of the data and, and, and things. So it kind of like really helps the students to, to visualize the data that they get. When we got the data, a lot of our students on both the Sweden side and the, the British side suggested that uh, the students in Sweden would have faster reaction times because they assumed that students in Sweden did more sports than the students in, in the United Kingdom. But then when we got the data back, it was the complete opposite. The students in the United Kingdom uh, had better reaction times. That forced the students to have to think about questioning why the data was so different to, to what they were expecting. And we ended up coming up with a lot of questions that we probably wouldn't have even thought about had we not done the data through Google Forms. So by hooking up and using something like Google Forms with other classrooms to get additional data, we were able to improve students' language about both the, the language of data collection, but also improve their questioning skills. And questioning skills are incredibly important as far as science and developing your science knowledge is concerned. 
Um, if you want to know the answer, it was because the British students drank a lot of Red Bull before the lesson, and so were on energy drinks, and that's why their reaction times were much faster. Um, from that, we then moved on with a similar group of schools to look at something called the World's Five Biggest Problems Project. We used Google Forms again uh, to communicate ideas and, and stuff. Um, the biggest things about these projects have been about looking outside of our own classroom and taking the, the language constructs of, of doing real science and seeing similarities and differences across the world and being able to communicate your ideas with very different people. Um, so that's proved very, very useful. Um, as far as where I'm at today, I'm currently looking at uh, things like game-based learning and how we can use that to help develop language skills and uh, uh, assessment in science. But I've also got on board Well, um, one of the things I've been looking at recently is this game here called The Art of Persuasion. It's actually based, it's actually a social sciences game, but it's designed to help students understand the language of trying to persuade and argue people, argue with people, both positive and negative arguing, which certainly within the Swedish science curriculum is actually quite a, a large part of the, the way in which students are assessed, being able to communicate what they have learned and evaluate both positive and negative sides of an argument. And so uh, I've been looking at how we might use that game in the science department to help students structure their scientific arguments as well as their, their social science arguments as, as well. Um, I think If you British Council has quite a few uh, resources. One of my favourite ones to get the kids to use is something called Comic Strip Maker, where the students can actually come up with their own uh, comic strips to explain certain things. The younger students, uh, uh, the younger students have. Um, in particular, like doing the comic strips uh, to explain stories and stuff. Uh, one of my favourites has been about Edward Jenner, uh, which is quite cool. Um, but all um, in modelling by doing. So when I was learning my Swedish, I made my video, made my teacher a video. And so I use this to show students on how to make uh, comic show, uh, comic strips and stuff and what they can do with them. Um, I have made some, uh, this particular one uses an iPad application called Puppet Pals. And the students can uh, choose their characters and add images and stuff. Um, this one is, is one that I did because this, this slide was for uh, some teacher training, but I have other ones that I can, um, about lenses and, and things. And again, it's all about getting the students to kind of present their ideas in new and different ways. By getting them to present in new and different ways, they kind of engage more with the language that they're using, which gets them, and especially if you use, sorry, especially if you use um, social media tools, which can be used out, used and seen outside of the classroom, they then get this authentic audience where they have to kind of in, think more carefully about how they structure their uh, their language. Um, just to, to kind of summarise, these were kind of like the the main points uh, about um, what I've kind of learned over the the course of time really. Um, I think the, the biggest plus points for me that I, I found is that, that students actually start asking more questions because they are more uh, familiar with the language of questioning um, and they kind of start summarising their own ideas and thoughts that little bit better. Um, 
it also helps them to see problems from different uh, angles because they get alternative opinions. They're not just restricted to what happens in my classroom. Other people can can come in and get involved in the conversation. The biggest uh, benefit of that was actually getting parents involved uh, through some of these projects that I've done. Uh, uh, I've been able to uh, get some of the um, sorry, get some of the uh, uh, parents who hadn't really um, made contact with the school before telling me that uh, they were working in universities doing research on some of the topics and kind of like coming in. So that's the kind of like where I'm where I'm at uh, now. Um, um, so oops, cool. um, um, so I now kind of like take a, a look at uh, some, some of the questions that have been posed. Yeah, it's, even if now uh, there is maybe not too many of them, uh, it's right now the good time to, to ask them. So I would like to invite everybody to, to, to write the question uh, to, to Fiona. That's the good moment right now. Fiona, do you see the question about the game? Uh, there, the other participants already uh, replied, but uh, can you confirm that it's the right answer? And maybe you can tell us a little more about it. So maybe, maybe we can go for this uh, web page once we have some time and explore it together a little bit. What do you think? So uh, someone asked about the the link to the games um i'm assuming you mean the the math games i see someone's already put that up i didn't put it up straight away because you know i was kind of busy but the, the one for the uh, uh art of persuasion is coming just there um and the uh, For one, for the comic strip, it is hit. Okay, so maybe we can visit this website uh, all together and explore a little more so everybody can benefit out of a uh, little journey over the website. Mm -hmm. So, um, in, so in the meantime, uh, I invite everybody to, to ask the questions because, uh, yeah, that's a good opportunity to, 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 to ask another question and know a little more about her wonderful initiative. Um, so, uh, some some dog you have to actually have um, an account for, um, but it's free to sign up to. Uh, where's the thing? So, um, uh, someone has just asked if I am using Edmodo or similar. I have used Edmodo in the past, um, but my school, my current school is a Google Apps school, so we tend to do everything through Google Apps uh, and Classroom. 
Um, my personal opinion is that uh, Edmodo is better, uh, but I am currently restricted to using Classroom because of the way our, our school has gone. Um, Classroom is getting better, uh, but I think uh, its big failing at the moment is that you can't actually group the students, uh, sorry, subgroup the students within a class. So um, you can only share things with your whole class or not at all. And also you can't get the students working collaboratively through classroom, which to me is kind of a bit counterintuitive to the whole purpose of Google Docs and, and stuff. Um, so we're a bit limited at the moment. Edmodo, if you haven't used it, is actually really quite good, especially if you're uh, collaborating with other schools. Um, and again, nice and free. Uh, and uh, if I can have a question, uh, maybe because I was really interested about this uh, part when you said that you involved parents, mm -hmm. could you could you say it a little more about it? Because it was only at the end, and uh, we are teachers, but also many of us are parents. So could you say it a little more about this experience? Yeah. So um, when I first started the the blog post, the first group of people that I shared stuff with. Were, were actually the parents of, of my class. Um, and I shared that through our, our school's news bulletin. Um, and they were all like a bit tentative at, at the beginning, but they all kind of like started having a look at what the students were doing and started leaving comments for them. Um, and uh, also my class Twitter account started to get used a little bit more at that time because the parents were interested to find out what topics might be coming up. And then the parents, when they were reading the blog, po blog posts, started contacting me and saying, um, did you know this person is involved in this particular activity? Do you want them to, to have a, a web chat with you or, or something? Because they, they live uh, in the north of Sweden. So, um, that was kind of cool. I, I got to find out a lot about what my parents did for work. And um, once I found out that, I was able to, to tap into a lot of that, um, get them actually into the classroom to come and talk about some of the things that they were doing. Um, and it was things that the parents themselves hadn't even thought would be uh, a, you know, welcomed, I, I guess. Um, so that was, that was pretty cool. Um, Google Classroom has been quite useful in helping parents to um, support their children a little bit more at home. Um, it's been quite a good way of sharing extra support material for students and, and things um, and, and allows you to have uh, a dialogue with parents. So often a lot of our parents don't like being called during the day. Um, because they're working, but by doing things like having a, a today's meet room for, for my classes, it allows the parents to actually send me questions and I can see them and respond to them as, as and when I have the time to, to, to do that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's just been really nice to, to allow the students to, uh, ex to share their work with a, a wider audience, really, um, rather than just waiting for like open days and stuff. Okay, I, I see. And uh, what about students? Uh, how do they uh, react uh, for the fact that they will, the parents can see it? Does it uh, help or actually it limits them? So uh, what do you think uh, from the student perspective? What kind of impact uh, the fact the parents can see it ha has it? Um, actually, generally speaking, I mean, I, I do class surveys at the end of every every school year. Um, and generally speaking, the, the, the kids really actually like it. Um, kids, kids actually do want their parents to be involved in their schoolwork. You know, they, they might not make it seem that way when they're at home. I mean, I'm, I'm a parent. I have a teenage son. He, he likes to pretend that he doesn't want me involved. 
Um, but actually, really, really, they do like being able to show the good stuff that they've done to their parents and, and things. So I think generally speaking, it's been pos been quite positive. There have been one or two that that haven't been. Um, but you, you deal with those on a, a person by person basis, really. Um, but I, I think from a the kids' point of view, a lot of them will say they use these tools anyway, but they didn't realise they could actually use them for learning, that they could do it for something other than just having a chat with their friends. So um, so it's been quite, quite good in that respect. Um, I noticed there's a, a question here about uh, assessment. Um, so, and, and what I'm doing with it, I'm just sharing a couple of websites well, names of websites, because I haven't got time to, um, uh, let me see if I can find some of them, actually. Uh, oh, no, I think it's probably best if I just share the names. Um, so, for assessment, in Sweden, we're not allowed to store uh, students' personal data, uh, including grading information on Google Class, uh, on Google because it's not stored in Sweden, it's stored on the cloud. So we can't use Google Forms uh, for assessment purposes in our school, but Google Forms is quite a good way of, of collecting, of doing student assessment. Um, certainly makes it very quick. Uh, I know language teachers use it a bit for spelling tests because you can get Google uh, Forms to self-correct, which is quite nice. But the ones that we tend to use for uh, uh, assessment in science and in social sciences, actually, are Socrative, Kahoot, and Yakapaka. And the good thing about, about all three of those, really, is that um, the more teachers that use them, the bigger the bank of questions are. Um, Kahoot, in particular, and Yakapaka are used quite a lot in Sweden, and so there's a lot of uh, assessment type questions that are there uh, that are actually linked more directly to our our curriculum but the the benefit of things like those is you can set them so the kids get instant feedback on on uh, how they're doing so that's quite quite important for those kind of things they're not used for uh, kind of big assessments but it's more those kind of like little assessments maybe halfway through a unit just to check how the kids are doing um, sometimes using it for like starter questions so that you find out um, whether students have misconceptions. Uh, for example, I used uh, Socrative as a, a voting kind of thing, uh, posed the students the question, you know, uh, where do trees get their mass from? And gave them, you know, four options to choose from. And that's quite good because it, it shows uh, it shows misconceptions right at the start, so you can see what you, what you need to do. So um, I found those three tools in particular useful. Um, there was another one, another question somewhere. Uh, the comic strip maker. Um, uh, someone's asked if it's for collaborative work. Um, it can be, uh, or you can do it individually. It depends. Uh, I usually get my students to work in pairs when they're making uh, the comic strips, simply because it gives them someone to bounce ideas off of when it comes to de uh, developing the dialogue. Um, so that's that's quite good. But I wouldn't use it for more than like three people, uh, a group of maybe of three, uh, because then the kids have a hard time making decisions about it. So. Okay, and uh, I know that I am maybe using my uh, uh, function a little bit too much, but uh, I really like it, so um, uh, I think and everybody can benefit out of uh, this question. Uh, it's a little beyond the scope, but uh, that just came to me. Um, how it works uh, with, uh, with the fact that the students uh, are familiar with using this kind of tools? Uh, are they interested to be present, to be visible in the web? Uh, in the in, in the network, I mean that uh, do they open their own blogs or the other initiative? Do you have any feedback uh, like that? Um, 
Yes, some have gone on to open their, their own blogs. Uh, something that we are looking into setting up for next school year um, is a TED Ed Club. A lot of people, a lot of teachers, I think, use the, the TED Talks in their, in their lessons now. And they, they have an organisation called TED Ed, which is another great place to look for lesson ideas and stuff. But we're actually looking into setting one, one of those up. That was actually students that came to us and asked if, if we would help them set that up for them because they, they want the world to see that, you know, students do have good ideas and they are capable of, of presenting those ideas if they're helped through the process. Um, and a lot of students I know are looking at TED Talks and TED Ed lessons on, on their own. Um, so, you know, being able to do that in school uh, is quite good. Other things that are quite good, the, the kids actually get quite a quite a, a, a joy out of teaching teachers how to use some of this stuff. Uh, they like sharing their knowledge. Um, and I, I think by using the social media tools, the whole learning process becomes much more collaborative rather than just a teacher telling a student how to write a lab report. It becomes more a collaboration between uh, multiple people. And so they like actually showing you what they actually, what they've learned. Um, so I often get uh, students coming up with new ideas for new tools um, that they've seen, but they don't know how to use. So my job then becomes, okay, finding out how we can use that in our classroom to do what we want. Um, so, I mean, I think I've actually been very lucky with the kind of students that I've, I've gotten um, in that they've all been very interested in it. Uh, you do get one or two that, that don't really like it, but I always give them the option of, of doing things in a traditional way if that's what they would prefer. So, and I, I think that's that's a kind of very Swedish way of doing things, allowing children to actually choose how they do, how they present their information. So, um, so we don't tend to get very many, when given the choice, kids will tend to do the, the stuff that they, that they like, and they do tend to like presenting things online. Their, their boundaries online are very different to ours as adults. So it's something that they're, they, they're very used to and they don't see a problem with, with doing. Um, I'm not sure that that answered your question. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's really nice to know that it has such a, a, a positive impact on them and uh, actually uh, make them familiar with um, this kind of, uh, let's say, solutions and they disseminate it and the other teachers also use it. Okay, so let's check one more time if we have any questions on chat. Um, yeah, I think we we managed to answer yeah. all of them. So I guess uh, that will be everything for tonight. Thank you very much, Fiona, for your uh, presentation. It was really interesting. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's webinar. And I really would like to invite everybody for the upcoming sessions. So I hope to see you soon, hear you soon. Bye. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.